Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Spencer Overton. I'm the president of the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, which is America's Black Think Tank. Thank you all for joining us today to discuss the rationale for and key elements of a business civil rights audit. Now, before we get started, I'd like to thank our amazing team that organized this event, including Marlissa Hudson and Renisha Best, the entire Joint Center staff, and our fabulous board led by Barbara Johnson. I'd also like to disclose to all of you that this event is being recorded uh, and will be publicly available on the Joint Center's website at a later date. Now, today we're joined by two wonderful guests who are highly regarded by the civil rights community. They're also great friends of the Joint Center. Laura Murphy is a business consultant and a national civil rights leader who pioneered the process for conducting civil rights audits of businesses. Uh, her groundbreaking audits of Airbnb in 2016 and Facebook in 2020 led to significant reforms at those companies. And her report, The Rationale for and Key Elements of a Business Civil Rights Audit, details why companies should conduct an independent civil rights audit and it provides a roadmap for doing so. Now, if there's one thing I want you to take away from today, it's to look at that report. The report will give you everything you need to have a thoughtful conversation with your colleagues about civil rights audits. Uh, I'm gonna put a copy of it here in the chat so that we're all uh, completely on the same page here. Just like I said, uh, outstanding uh, report. Now, before her civil rights auditing work, Laura led the ACLU Washington uh, Legislative Office for 17 years, where she was the first woman and first African-American in that role. And she crafted a, a reputation for building effective bipartisan coalitions and for being a champion for justice and uh, equity. Personally, my conversations with Laura have led to the Joint Center digging into the tech space, and I really appreciate her wisdom, her counsel, and her commitment to civil rights. Roy Austin Jr. is the Vice President of Civil Rights and the Deputy General Counsel for Meta, formerly known as Facebook. Roy joined the company in January 2021 to establish this company civil rights team, which was a recommendation of Laura's audit. Uh, now in setting up civil rights at Meta, Roy's playing an incredibly key role in charting out the future of civil rights in the tech industry and in large companies globally. Uh, Meta really, uh, you know, they, they were really fortunate. I mean, Roy previously served as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division. And after that, he led the White House Office of Urban Affairs, Justice and Opportunity in the Obama administration. In that position, he co-authored a report on big data and civil rights. He played key roles uh, on various projects like President Obama's 21st Century Policing Task Force and the My, Brother, My Brother's Keeper Task Force. I'm also fortunate to call Roy a close friend. Now we have a, a robust discussion planned for y'all today. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna get started with Laura to lay the groundwork. Uh, and so uh, Laura, uh, let me just, you know, I've, I've read the report, but just to brass tacks, lay it out in a very fundamental way, what is a civil rights audit? Well, first I have to say thank you, Spencer, because this report would not have been possible without the wise counsel that you afforded me and that of uh, 30 other civil rights leaders. So um, I've enjoyed collaborating with you and I really respect the work of the Joint Center. So thank you for that. But as to your question, what is a civil rights audit? A civil rights audit is an independent analysis conducted by firms with civil rights expertise that assess an organization's business policies, practices, and products to determine whether those components have a discriminatory effect on people who have been historically subject to in inequity and injustice. After an initial assessment, the auditors work with the company to issue a public report to provide a blueprint for corrective and proactive equitable outcomes. 
An audit will also help ensure that structures are in place to advance civil rights changes and to prevent future civil rights harms. So now, Laura, uh, what inspired you to develop to create a civil rights audit? I mean, and, and what exactly does the audit entail? Well, audits wouldn't exist without the leadership of the civil rights community approaching American corporations and asking them uh, to do something about discriminatory practices. So in the case of Airbnb, um, a number of civil rights leaders expressed concerns about um, a social media campaign called Airbnb While Black, as well as a Harvard Business School study that said that um, Black guests had a higher rate of rejection than their white counterparts. And so the civil rights community became alarmed and started reaching out to Airbnb and Airbnb finally uh, responded and they asked around for a consultant and I just got referred to Airbnb. And so what I created at Airbnb was a product of interviews with civil rights leaders about their concerns. And so um, I think Airbnb hired me because they had this narrow concern about um, black guests um, encountering a higher rate of rejection. And what happened was when I began asking questions, all of the questions asked by civil rights leaders, it led to a much broader analysis of what are Airbnb's policies, practices, and products that may or may not contribute to discrimination. So for example, we discovered that Airbnb did not have a prominent and robust anti-discrimination policy. And so we brought in former Attorney General Eric Holder to write up a new anti-discrimination policy. We looked at their diversity and inclusion practices and found out that they could be doing, they weren't getting the input of some of their own people of color, you know, in, in, in terms of coming up with solutions and that sort of thing. So what started out was just a, a, a survey based on my conversations with civil rights leaders about a variety of concerns. And then what happened was I created a, a template for asking questions in the various verticals within Airbnb. And then what happened was um, the civil rights community was pleased with that process. They felt like they were engaged throughout that entire process. And they gave my name to what was then called Facebook, now called Meta, um, and suggested to Facebook that they engage in a similar process to Airbnb. And at the same time, all of this was going on, Starbucks had an incident where some black guests were the police were called on, on them and they hired Eric Holder to do an investigation and they came out with a report and I consulted with them early on in the report, although the ultimate report was Eric Holder's work. And they came out with a, a similar survey of concerns and brought them forward to Starbucks and got Starbucks to respond um, in a public report. So my uh, report, the, the rationale for and key elements of a business civil rights audit was built on that body of work that happened at three companies. Um, that, that's appreciated now and in really helpful context. Um, so we talked about three companies uh, where there were audits. And in terms of those companies, do you plan to release a second round of audits for those organizations you've already engaged in terms of Meta and Airbnb? You know, how, I think people would say, how will these companies be held accountable? You know, why isn't this just, okay, there's a public report, et cetera, and it just, you know, dissipates and kind of goes away and people move on to new issues. 
Well, in the interest of full disclosure, I still consult with Airbnb and um, I wrote a follow-up report to my 2016 report. I wrote a follow-up report in 2019 and Airbnb is planning to write its own report this year. Um, and that will be a follow-up to the 2016 and 2019 reports. So they on their own have agreed to a schedule of disclosure. Likewise, my understanding with Starbucks is that there have been follow-up reports. While I was doing the audit with Facebook, which was a much longer audit than the one with Airbnb, because it's 20 times bigger than Airbnb, at least, um, there were um, reports in 2018, 2019, and the final report in 2020. And I think it's, I don't want to speak for Roy Austin, who's their vice president for civil rights. I think it's their intention to continue to give updates, public updates on their progress toward meeting um, some of the concerns addressed in, in, in my report. So um, the cadence is specific to each company, but I think once they um, get the benefit of having this public dialogue, I, I think they also see the benefit in continuing the dialogue because I, mean, I don't know corporations that want to be, be accused of engaging or facilitating in discrimination. And so now that people are concerned about these issues and they're much more vocal about these issues in the corporate realm, I think um, companies that do these audits will have an incentive to continue to follow up and, and, and disclose their progress toward reaching certain goals. Mm -hmm. and, and just, um, you know, for everyone who is here, you know, there are reports that you've done on particular companies like Airbnb and Facebook. And then there's this report that's basically the case for businesses to do an audit that's kind of an introduction to the process as, as a whole. And in that document, I think you've got listed the changes that have been made at those three different companies, Meta, uh, uh, Airbnb, and Starbucks as a result of the uh, audits uh, uh, here. Uh, and so we, we can see some tangible change from an accountability standpoint, even in that report uh, that you produced uh, uh, here. Um, so now it, let's, let's kind of turn to, you talked a lot about the civil rights community and uh, their priorities and, and, and uh, you know, litigation isn't the only tool. Uh, there, there are some other things here. Let's look at it from the perspective of the company right now, all right? So what's the business case for conducting a civil rights audit? Well, the business case is manifold. First of all, businesses make up some two thirds of the GDP, as you are fond of saying, Spencer. Um, and so if civil rights are going to take place in the United States, it can't be a sole function of the government it has to happen in the private sector as well. So corporations, I think, have an interest in assuring their customers, their employees, that they are not perpetuating discrimination. And this is not about intentional discrimination. This is about basically the, the impact of policies, products, practices, and services on communities. And so they, there could be all kinds of benign intent but if the effect is that a bank doesn't have um, mortgage products available to minority communities, if the effect is that a company only seems to deposit its toxic waste sites in uh, communities of color, if the effect is that companies are um, using uh, facial recognition software that cannot tell one brown person from the other or one Asian person from the other, or the effect is there is an unfriendly environment to people with disabilities, to women, to members of the LGBTQ community. You know, these things create uh, 
tremendous reputational problems for corporations. And boards of directors are increasingly concerned about reputational damage and the impact that has on the bottom line. I also believe that um, what we saw in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd was that society becomes very turbulent, um, dysfunctional and unstable when there is, is a roiling of racial discrimination and other forms of discrimination. And some two thirds of the Fortune 500 companies made statements that they were supportive of Black Lives Matter or they were, uh, they were against um, excessive use of force by police departments, but people are not satisfied with those statements. Investors are not satisfied with those statements. And what's really interesting to me is that there is a growing activist investor community around environmental, social, and governance issues, the ESG community. And they are demanding that corporations be more accountable to the uh, population and to their workforce and to their investors about um, discrimination issues and work to reduce those issues. So there is a, a bottom line interest. You know, your stock prices can be adversely affected if your reputation is damaged. But society as, as a whole, there, there's an in interest that corporations have in having a diverse and stable workforce. And, and they, they can contribute to that by corporate behavior. Corporate, corporations can incentivize certain behaviors in the larger society. And so um, those are just some of the reasons um, businesses sh should do that. But, but also, you know, a lot of these civil rights organizations are also litigating organizations. And so it can be very costly to engage in discrimination. You could face lawsuits under the Fair Housing Act, the Equal Employment Opportunity Act. And why not get ahead of those issues? Why not save yourself a lot of money by bringing in an independent auditor with civil rights expertise to look at your policies, practices, products, and services to determine whether or not they are engaging in any form of discrimination and root it out before you face litigation. This is a voluntary exercise on the part of corporations that can really put them ahead of the game. Appreciate all that background, uh, Laura. And uh, you know, you talked about civil rights organizations later and a variety played key roles, at least with regard to, to Meta. Uh, you know, just as a point of personal privilege, I really just want to hold up the leadership of Vanita Gupta, Sherilyn Eiffel, and Rashad Robinson. I really thought they were critical. They were engaged. They all run really major and significant organizations, and they took the time and were personally vested in moving things forward. I mean, I just think the three of them just demonstrated outstanding leadership. And obviously, there were many others uh, that played critical roles. But uh, the three of them in particular just did a, did a stellar uh, job. So now, uh, uh, Laura, Roy Austin and his team reflect the product uh, you know, of the, the civil rights audit uh, of the, the company formerly known as Facebook uh, here. Uh, you know, they're the manifestation of many of your observations, Laura. They're the manifestation of, of your analysis, your recommendations. And so, Laura, I'll turn it over to you uh, to maybe uh, talk a little bit to Roy. Okay, thank you, Spencer. Roy, it's so wonderful to see you. Um, I, like Spencer, I also consider you a friend. I'm excited that someone of your caliber is the first uh, vice president for civil rights in any major corporation in America. And that's fascinating to me. Um, can you talk a little bit about your journey to uh, Facebook, now Meta, and uh, why you decided to do this job? So let me first say a huge thank you to you, Laura. Uh, you know, first of all, I, I've known you. I don't, I don't know when we met, but, you know, sometime during those 17 years as the head of uh, the Washington Legislative Office of the ACLU, we met. Uh, I've followed your work since then, and, and you've been 
and continue to be a powerhouse uh, on all things civil rights and, and, and human rights. Uh, and then also a huge thank you to, to Spencer and, and the Joint Center for inviting me to this conversation and for Spencer for um, continuing to engage. Uh, we've taken uh, you know, one part of Laura's work and that's the reach out to the civil rights community. And we've continued that. Um, and Spencer has been uh, a, a major part of that as we continue to seek um, the thoughts, the ideas, the intel, intelligence uh, and intel of the civil rights community. So let me start there. You know, I, I could go on and on and on about my journey, but I think that the, the number one way to look at this is I started off prosecuting hate crimes and, and police brutality cases for the Department of Justice. And there I had a direct impact on um, the, the victims of those crimes and, and the defendants. And always we heard, you know, just a few bad apples everywhere else. And so it wasn't leading to systemic change. Moved on in my career a little bit later and worked on patterns and practices of, of law enforcement violations of the Constitution. And we did consent decrees for entire uh, police departments. And uh, there, you know, we talked about the entire police department and then every other police department would look at it and say, well, we're not like that department. Um, and so, again, the systemic change was not happening in the way I, I hoped it would. Then went on and at the Obama White House worked on um, the task force on 21st century policing uh, and how we were going to implement that. And there we were finally reaching the point where we might possibly touch the 18,000 police departments around the country and ways that they could ensure that they weren't discriminating against people of color. And then this opportunity came to me and Laura, I, I mean, again, a huge thank you. I mean, I, I wouldn't have had this title. I wouldn't have had this job. I wouldn't have thought of doing this had it not been uh, for someone like you and with your credibility saying that this was something that was important and should be done. Look, Meta touches um, 3.5 billion monthly users of its products, whether that be Instagram or Facebook Blue, as, as it is sometimes called, um, WhatsApp, uh, Oculus is one of our, our, our newer um, platforms. We have 5 billion uh, posts every day uh, across our platforms. So the idea of growing and, and touching um, more people and, and, and again, bending, hopefully bending the curve a little bit more toward justice is what brought me to this job. Um, and, and we talked about it before I, I took it on because I was like, I, what am I getting myself into, Laura? This is, <laughs> this is, this is crazy. Um, you, you've, you've created this thing that doesn't exist and, and how am I going to jump into it? So that's, that's my path there. Um, but, but let me turn it to you for a second and say, you know, when you, what were you thinking when you created the idea of a vice president of civil rights? So what happened, Roy, was that in the process of doing these three reports for Facebook, we discovered that our work would never be done. There were too many tentacles. There were too many issues that we couldn't get into in, in as much depth as we liked. And we knew that the those areas of concern. I'll give you one example, algorithmic bias. We knew that Facebook uses thousands of algorithms and we wanted to understand their impact on, uh, you know, the Muslim community on, you know, the LGBTQ community. And we couldn't just dive into all of those things. So we decided in order for the work to continue, Facebook needed to have its own Office of Civil Rights. And because um, Facebook is so huge and touches every aspect of our lives, I, I keep have to, I have to train myself to say meta, sorry, folks. Meta is so huge and, and it, it touches every aspect of our life. For example, you, if you wanna know about a school closing for your children, the best thing to do is to go to your school's Facebook page. So for everything from merchandise to jobs to housing, all of this happens on this huge platform that's ubiquitous. And we knew we needed somebody like Roy Austin to get in there full time and look at the implications of Facebook's behavior, its algorithms, its advertising practices, its speech um, policing practices and look at the behavior 
on, on civil rights. And so I'm turning the question back to you, Roy. So we did this report. So is that a blueprint for what you're doing? I'm, I'm sure it's not the only blueprint. How are, you, how are you attacking these huge civil rights problems that affect all of us? Yeah, well, it is, it is absolutely a blueprint. Um, and you were prescient in your, um, in your feeling that there are so many tentacles and it is so important to have someone internally and, and being internal now, I, I feel that. And uh, let, let me be very clear, my, my greatest strength is identifying really, really good people to do really important work. And so uh, one of the things the audit called for is not only the creation of, a, of an office of civil rights, but uh, allow that person to build a team. So I now have a team of 11 and um, my team of 11 is uh, 10 women. Um, I believe it is eight women of color. It is somewhere in the range of 150 years of civil rights experience. It is uh, powerhouses. It is Cynthia Deedle, Julie Wenna, Manar Wahid, Liz Kennedy, Susan Epstein, uh, Ruchika Hodel, who is the only person um, who worked with you on the audit a little bit, who's back on there, uh, Rashida Gundy. Um, uh, we have, um, and, and now once I started going down names, of course, the, the, they're slipping me, but Jade Mays, um, uh, Leah, Carter Wynn, um, I think I got them all. But the, the, the point is, is these are people who know and live and understand civil rights and can take on different issues. So Cynthia looks at law enforcement and hate. Um, Liz Kennedy looks at voting and civic engagement. Susan Epstein, exactly what you're talking about with algorithmic bias. This is a woman who taught computer science at Stanford and was on a school board and has been doing civil rights work for most of her career. Um, you know, Julie Wenna was with Airbnb and worked with you on uh, Airbnb's audit, came over and is now leading our product work. So, uh, you know, I could go down every one, but the, the point is, is the way we've done this is to take people who are experts and use your audit as a roadmap for what I was going to do with the pillars of the team. Um, and, and so, and then I, I should just note, and, and then in November, we issued a response to the audit. And, and the point of that was twofold. One was, I wanted to make it clear to everyone that, that the team was actually doing something. Like we were, we were in there, we were working, we were new to an 80,000 person organization, um, which is how big meta is, that, that we were actually doing that work. The second thing was to tell all the employees of the company that it wasn't like a one and done, like here's your audit, here are the things that you need to do better, but we're never gonna look at it again. No, no, here's your audit, and we are going to hold ourselves out publicly to doing the things that the audit called for. Um, but it was also a statement of, there is so much more work to be done. Like you spent two years working on this audit and we're not even able to unearth um, many of the things and dig as deeply on many of the things as you would have hoped to have been able to do. Um, and I wanted to make sure that that message, and then who knew that we were gonna be working on the metaverse? <laughs> Manar Wahid walks in and I say, Manar, guess what? You're working on the metaverse. She said, the what? You find out and you tell us <laughs> what the civil rights implications are of the metaverse. And so Manar has, has dug in deeply on that. So anyway, I, you know, to answer your question directly, your audit was essential, fundamental, um, but was the starting point of what is hopefully a, a, a very long-term um, position uh, within the company that has an impact on ensuring that the company is treating people right, um, particularly looking at your historically and systemically marginalized communities. So what would you tell um, a corporation that's nervous about doing an audit and that's nervous about having a function like yours. Um, you know, I hear from a lot of corporate leaders that, you know, this is going to open Pandora's box. This is going to uh, hurt our reputation. What would you tell those companies about your role and 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 audits? Yeah. Um, 
just do it. I mean, it's started to steal it from Nike, but number one, you know, I, I think Meta's reputation is enhanced by the fact that they have a team of serious civil rights people who are working day to day on civil rights issues. I think the business case that you were talking about is enhanced by the fact that you have a team that is internal to you that is working on civil rights issues, whether it be your employees, whether it be your creators, whether it be your business partners, regardless of who it is, who your company is dealing with, the idea that you have a team that is working on civil rights issues makes you better. I mean, a ton of our users, a ton of our users come from these historically and systemically marginalized communities. If we are a company that is about voice, we want to be elevating Black voices. We want to be elevating Latino voices. We want to be elevating LGBTQ and, and people with disabilities and women. Um, and, and, and we want to make sure that their voices are not getting, uh, you know, that, that, that there is room for their voices and that their voices are heard. We want to make sure that, that um, our business partners, the people who are the creators out there, are a diverse set of creators who are going to reach these new audiences. So there is a huge business case for having a civil rights team. And I, I can't see any really good reason not to do it. And as you noted, look, you, you face lawsuits if you're not getting in front of these issues. You face employee issues if you're not getting in front of these issues. You face regulatory issues if you're not getting in front of these issues. And so I think it's incredibly important. And, and let me just say one other thing. It is also very important that the team is supported. I, I, I lucked into having, you know, Cheryl Sandberg, who you worked very closely with, who was very supportive of this, who made sure that the audit was released publicly. And Jen Newstead, the GC of the company, has given me the freedom um, to really, first of all, to build the team, but to also get in many, many rooms uh, throughout the company. Well, you know, Roy, I'm not saying anything that I haven't said publicly and in the press. Um, I think your team needs to be at least five times as big, considering the scale and the impact of the company. But um, I'm going to put that uh, request on my fellow civil rights leaders like Spencer to advocate for that. I mean, I think you've already saved the company a lot of headache and a lot of money um, by doing what you're doing. So I, I'm, I'm very excited about um, your work. Uh, Roy, when you, um, how are you setting priorities? Are you, are you setting priorities with the leadership or are you kind of, uh, is it an adversarial position within the company? What, how are you setting priorities? Yeah, so I, I, it, it's not adversarial at all. It, 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 and it's a company that is, that is not adversarial. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a very different place from any place that I've ever worked before in that Meta operates like Facebook operates. Like the CEO can be up there having a conversation with the company. And there are people in the chat saying, I disagree with the CEO. And you're like, whoa, 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 wait, that, <laughs> we don't have that kind of openness, but, but that's how the company operates. And so, you know, my relationship with other leaders within the company is, is I can have very honest conversations with them. What is incredibly important for me with respect to the team is we, we have to be evidence-based. Like it's one thing for me to roll in and say, oh, I think you should do X. That, that, you know, that's my opinion. What we do as a team is we, we actually put together, we research these issues so that we are making the points as strongly as possible. We are making the business case. We're making the anti-discrimination case. We are, we are making that case for the company, for decisions at the company that, that we think the company needs to make in, in different areas. As far as prioritization, I, you know, we have these pillars. And have made it very clear to the members of the team who are working on these pillars that, that they need to achieve significant impact on their issue area. So whether that issue area is hate speech or that issue area is on policies or on product, they have to do significant work on those. The other thing is we have some overarching things that we're working on. 
One is just civil rights training. The company never had civil rights training. So we've started that process with a group that's called Product Legal, the, the, the legal for folks who are over the products. Uh, and we are looking to expand that and, and have, you know, I would say, you know, pretty close to done a civil rights training that anyone in the company can take. We also have something called race measurement um, and the civil rights training led originally by Ruchika Hodel, Minar Wahid is, is leading that at, at the moment. Um, race measurement. Lots of people think that Meta knows the race of, you know, everyone and, and what they're doing and what's not. It actually does not. This is a situation which I ran into in, in the policing world where we're like, well, you're stopping and searching too many black, brown and native people. And they're like, we don't know who we're stopping. And we're like, well, then you need to get the data to do so. And they're like, well, we don't want to do the data because if we do the data, then you're going to tell us that we're doing so. And I'm saying, well, <laughs> you got to actually get the data. Facebook doesn't right now have the data to determine how it's impacting marginalized communities. I want them to do that. So how do we do it in a way that's privacy protected, in a way that ensures that, um, you know, that, in, that ensures that the information is, is good quality information using the best statistical models that we can find. So they had started talking about that. Our team uh, really pushed hard on making that a reality and we are doing that right now. So that's kind of an overarching thing that we have to be doing and doing right. We also have a project that we're working on to help when people are making products ask the question, are we building with system, historically and systemically marginalized communities in mind? Are we building something that will not harm those communities? So how do we make sure that those questions are asked at the beginning of the process and at the end of the process? So we're building a tool like that. Um, and, and I'll just throw out another just priority is of course, um, voting and civic engagement is, you know, you see by the posters behind me, um, there is probably no movement bigger than maybe the anti-lynching movement for the civil rights community than voting and civic engagement. And there's no doubt that Meta plays a role in making sure that everyone has accurate information and everybody can get out there and vote. We want to make sure that that Meta uh, is doing right by by voting. Roy, thank you. I want to turn it back to Spencer for Q and A. Thank you so much, Roy. Thanks a lot, thank Roy. You. And um, I'm gonna. There's a poll. Have you read Laura Murphy's audit? Yes. <laughs> we're gonna. Yes, enjoyed it. So we gotta uh -oh. respond to that. Oh, host and <laughs> panelists cannot vote here. So, uh, but everyone else- Yeah, I tried to vote. It wouldn't let me vote. Right, exactly. Uh, disenfranchised. <laughs> uh, so we're going to go to uh, Q&A here. And I think we have got a question from Star Barber to start off with. Star, are you there? Um, she is on the train. So she okay. was wondering if we could read her question for her. Sure, I will do that. How do we mobilize this effort in an impactful way that drives real change in how these businesses operate externally and internally? How do we codify the application of this process similar to the domain of financial audit and the COSO framework? And that actually stands for Committee of Sponsoring Organizations Framework. That's a system used to establish internal controls to be integrated into business practices. So these controls provide reasonable assurance that the organization's operating ethically, transparently, and in accordance with established industry standards when we talk about COSO uh, framework here. So um, let me turn it over to you all, uh, Roy and, and Laura. Well, I Laura, all you. Okay, thank you. I certainly believe that there should be standards. The report that I wrote was just a beginning to talk about what should be included in the report, the, the 10 key elements in any civil rights audit. Um, certainly, just like in the environmental field, there a building can become LEED certified for its energy efficiency. I certainly want to be part of a movement that develops independent standards. So 
we don't have the situation where we have in the environmental community of greenwashing, where companies say, oh, we're taking care of our civil rights issues and against what standard can we measure that? And so I hope to be um, in my next phase of work, working with the foundation to um, help figure out how we can do training for our auditors, maybe look at um, key performance measures for audits, um, you know, recruit auditors who are committed to civil rights and that sort of thing, because I don't know if you all know this, but just this year, some 25 shareholder proposals have been introduced to ask corporations to engage in racial equity or civil rights audits. So it looks like this process is here to stay. Okay, so I think we are going to turn to Karen Narasaki, who has been a great friend of the Joint Center and has personally been a wonderful mentor to me. Karen, are you there? Yes, <clears throat> yes thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm interested. <laughs> Good to see you guys and hear about the work you're doing. In my experience in working on diversity within corporations, it's really challenging to get the buy-in you need from all the different executives within very large companies to produce the data that's really necessary to the work and to executing on the recommendation. So I'm wondering what uh, the company is doing. Are they doing it through uh, targeting compensation and letting their execs know that that will be part of their review or how is that all happening? Uh, certainly in Airbnb, uh, they adopted the Rooney rule. And my understanding is that their, that their, uh, their uh, ability to create diverse teams is part of their review. Um, but in terms of buy-in from executives, I think it starts at the top. And one of the things that um, I feel is essential and is part of the, the uh, 10 key recommendations out of my report is the CEO, the board of directors and the C-suite need to be bought into the civil rights audit or else you do not have the cooperation of the senior, executives and middle managers that you need in order to carry out this function. So um, I think you're absolutely right to raise that point, Karen. And it's something that I talked about in my report. And, and I just want to add um, what's been important. And again, without any formal structure to it, I mean, on, on my first week of the job, I was invited to uh, introduce myself to the entire company by Mark himself. Uh, a little later on, when we did the response to the audit, again, introduced, I was uh, allowed to speak to the entire company about that. Uh, having his support, having Sheryl Sandberg's support um, is incredibly important. Um, and it, it, it sends a signal to the other leaders of the company that, you know, this is a team that, um, you know, I, I expect to have a voice in the decisions that are that are coming up to us. Um, I also want to make it very clear that we are very different than DE&I. Um, and I, and I, because, and I want to make that clear because I don't want corporations to think, oh, well, we, we, you know, we have our DEI person. Um, we are talking about legal standards around discrimination as a civil rights team. Um, we are not just talking about diversity and, and, you know, what the, um, the group of employees looks like. Uh, and that's a much different um role than has ever existed in a company before you know and i think it's you know if you have someone who is your marketing head or your communications head you pick someone who's an expert in that and i think these companies need to find people who are experts in civil rights um, who understand how the law works in these spaces to be the advisors on civil rights issues uh, within the company and I, and I just think it's a it's a place that is um, that has not existed in corporate America, uh, really, until uh, Laura, uh, you and, and your audit um, called it out. Okay, so we have got a question from 
Dr. Dominique Harrison, who's been the tech director for the Joint Center uh, for uh, 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 Political and Economic Studies in the past, and is also the author of the report, Expanding Broadband in the Black Rural South. Dominique, are you there? Roy, here's Dominique's question. It is. And I am here. Okay, here she is. <laughs> Thank you so much, Spencer. Really appreciate this discussion today. So my question um, is for you, Roy. So I understand that your team is building a tool that centers communities of color from the onset of product development. But can you talk about, if at all, how you are operationalizing your work to ensure that your team is required to be a part of the review of products before they get out of the door? or you know, other kind of second iterations of the product. So this is similar to the functions of like legal and risk and compliance teams within companies. I know they play a very important role before things are, um, you know, get the stamp of approval to, to be public. So just wanted to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, and, and this, is, this is the work again, I think I mentioned is being led by Julie Wenna uh, on the team. And look, and I've made this clear to the company is, I, I'm, I, I accept, the challenge and I accept that we have to prove our value and prove what we're going to do. So it's it's going to start as a pilot um, and we are going to pick uh, a number of products to run through this process to show that this process can be done uh, efficiently and in a way that is beneficial to the company. So we're not going to start off from a point of it's going to be mandatory across the company. We're going to start off from a point of here, here are a bunch of products that have gone through this. Look how well it went. Look how clear and concise the feedback loop is on it. Um, and it is something that there's no reason not to do more broadly. Um, but I, you, look, just like the audit itself, just like my position itself, we are brand new. And, and, and look, I want to make sure I get this right. And I want to make sure our team gets this right before we uh, start saying that this is something that that needs to be mandatory uh, across our company or across industry. Uh, and and look, we are we something that we have done is is we have reached out to um, an HBCU and HSI who are going to also help to make sure that our tool uh, is working the way it should work. Um, the importance of you know look, I, I am within the company. I tell my team every day. Um, that we talk, that we are not here to be drinking the Kool-Aid, but we also, I also recognize when you're inside of an institution that you sometimes lose perspective. That's why it's very important that I maintain a relationship with Spencer, the Joint Center, and a number of other civil rights organizations to, to call out when we are not doing what needs to be done or when there's more that we should be doing. But it's also the importance of bringing in independent voices to the very specific work that we are doing to make sure that we are seeing things. So. Short answer to your question is we're going to start it off as a pilot. We're going to see how it goes. We're going to evaluate it and then we'll make decisions from there as to um, how broad it should be implemented. Okay, so here's what we are going to do. And thank you, Dr. Harrison. Uh, here's what we're going to do. Uh, Roy and Laura, I ask that you all get out your pens and pencils or whatever you want to use to write things down. We're gonna have several folks talk, and then we're gonna ask you to basically uh, both close and respond to the questions uh, here, right? So we're gonna kind of run through in kind of sprinting style a few questions here, one after the other. We're gonna let folks ask their questions. You guys are gonna kind of take notes, write them down, and then you're gonna to respond to everyone at once, at least a couple of the questions from Crystal and Karen are related, but there, there some others might have some common themes as well. So let's bring on uh, Prakash uh, Jenna Kiraman uh, here. Prakash, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Can you all hear me? We can. Perfect. Well, thank you, Roy, and hi, Laura. It's good to see you. Um, I just had a couple of quick questions. So uh, I run a company called Nextdoor. I'm one of the founders. And we are about a thousand times smaller than Facebook. Uh, if you're if you're at 80,000 80, employees, we're just inching up on 700. And as I heard you talk about the role of the civil rights organization and having only 11 people inside of an 80,000 person organization, I'm just wondering 
what advice you might offer a smaller company like us in adhering to the same sort of principles, um, but kind of right-sizing it for, for the scale of company that we're at today, or maybe how to integrate it, uh, the function in such a way that we could scale into something similar as we grow. And then the second question I had was, um, obviously, it's challenging to maintain influence across all of the company's operations uh, in a company so large. And so I'm just wondering what key metrics or measures you might use to understand the impact of the work that your team does to influence all of these different aspects of the company. Okay, Prakash, thank you so much. Uh, let's hear uh, one, two, three from Crystal Torres, Dehera, Karen Heiser, and Janice Under, uh, Underwood. They have questions that have some overlapping themes. Crystal, Karen, and or Janice. Karen and Crystal, their questions are in the chat. So Karen's is, how can local governments utilize, utilize a civil rights audit process to identify and inform change? That's from Karen. Okay, Crystal's question is, have you conducted any audits in the public sector? Have these been focused on the private sector so far? This seems relevant and important for private or for public sector organizations as well. Janice uh, basically says, uh, once companies and public sector agencies do the audit and make the reforms necessary, or at least make the commitment to turn toward reform, what suggestions can you offer for sustainability across an institution's leadership or changing administrations? And then, so there, there are those that, you know, all seem to be related. And then I just do want to uh, sneak in uh, a question from Earl Peake, which is given uh, the CFPB report today on capital disparity. Uh, it, you know, released a report on financial challenges facing rural communities and the New York mayor not allowing Wells Fargo to get any more city business. Does this audit need to involve access to capital, opportunities, and uh, contracting here? So uh, why don't we turn it over to you, Roy and Laura, both to, you know, respond to some of the issues that have been teed up and, you know, provide any uh, closing thoughts and then I'll, uh, I'll close this out. Laura, why don't you go first? Okay, Prakash, um, I, I think even though you're a thousand times smaller than uh, Facebook, I think it's important to focus on your key deliverables as a company and looking, if you do an audit, scoping it is going to be very important to have the maximum impact. Um, and so the questions need to be flushed out in the beginning and that's how you come up with your key performance standards. So with Nextdoor, it might be you know, how you handle, I'm just guessing, you know, uh, complaints about minorities, you know, engaging in crime and, you know, how you handle those and, and how you moderate content around people who seem to be targeted, may be targeted on your platform. I'm just taking a wild guess here, so don't hold it against me. Um, but Roy, maybe you can talk about uh, key performance uh, metrics. Yeah, so so first of all, on, on size, look, we're, we're not, we are a team of 11, but, but to be very, very clear, we're working with the external affairs team, with the policy team, with the integrity team, with the compliance team, with um, responsible innovation, responsible artificial intelligence. There, there are a ton of different teams that we work with, um, and that helps to, you know, expand our, our, our ability and our reach. Metrics, it, it depends on what we're talking about here. You know, if the question is, you know, how do we ensure that there are responsible uh, recommendations that that someone who is looking at a video of a uh, of a black man interacting with a police officer does not get a recommendation that says gorillas, okay, that is something which we can, you know, we we make sure that that recommendation doesn't happen again. We can test for that. We can determine the prevalence of uh, of of, of language of hate speech on the platform. So how do we reduce that? But we can also just make policies and ensure that our policies are protecting 
our Muslim community, are protecting our LGBTQ uh, community. Uh, and there are things that we can simply ensure are, in fact, policies that are making sure things are right. I could keep going on this, but let me let's get back to the other questions with the limited time we have. But happy to talk further uh, offline if uh, if anybody wants to about any of this. So for Karen, Crystal and Karen, they had similar questions around public sector. Um, local governments have used racial equity audits. I think you can just Google that and you might come up with some police departments in North Carolina that hired firms to do an audit. Um, I think um, former Attorney General Eric Holder did an audit of a Seattle hospital system, I believe, or I, I can't, don't quote me on that. Um, but there, yeah, this, the principles involved in the um, key elements of a business civil rights audit can be applied to public sector institutions. And again, I would say the same thing holds. It has to have, it has to be public. It has to have qualified civil rights experts doing it. It has to have the key embrace of the executives in those jurisdictions. So definitely there has and should be overlap for what we've designed for business to the public sector. Roy? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have anything on um, on the public sector, private sector. I don't know of any, like we did, I, I you know, the, the pattern and practice investigations we did on police departments um, shows that you can do this stuff with a public um, a public sector organization. Let me just say in closing from, from my perspective, first of all, huge thank you again to you, Spencer, for your leadership on, on, on you know, in, in everything you do, whether it be judicial nominations, whether it be jobs, whether it be this panel right here, you you and the Joint Center do absolutely incredible and, and vital work uh, for the, the civil rights community. Uh, Laura, a huge thank you to you. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I stay in touch with you because you're of your leadership in this and just your smarts and, and, and just the ability to have honest conversations with you. And thank you uh, for joining me on this. And then to everyone who's on here listening, I just want to say, look, it, you know, it, it's always a little bit of a challenge when you're, you're asked to look inside of yourself and to, and to figure out whether, you're, you know, what you're doing is, is, is right. But, you know, if you are a person who cares about civil rights, civil liberties, human rights, cares about how people are treated, wants to make sure that you and your company are treating people the way they should be treated, and that you don't believe in discrimination, there is no reason not to uh, conduct a civil rights audit, no reason not to elevate an expert of, in civil rights in your company. Uh, and I really hope that you, you strongly and seriously consider doing so. All right, well, we certainly appreciate you, Laura and Roy, for the work that you're doing, for joining us today. I wanna to just take a final moment, say two quick things for those of you all who are in companies and thinking about how to encourage your colleagues to engage in a civil rights audit that builds on uh, Roy's points. First, you know, your efforts are essential uh, here. Uh, even if the Joint Center and civil rights groups and elected officials completely reform public policy, we're not gonna address systemic bias without leadership in the private sector. So the work is incredibly important. Uh, second, you know, maybe you feel like Laura and Roy are experts, but you feel like you don't know enough about civil rights audits to explain uh, them to your, your more skeptical colleagues about why your company should conduct a civil rights audit. I urge you to look at Laura's report. This was really just the, the tip of the iceberg uh, here. You know, her report, we'll put it in the link again so you, you have it, it's in the invitation. You know, if there's one thing to take away for, from today, I think it's to look at Laura's report. It gives you everything you need to have a thoughtful conversation with your colleagues about uh, civil rights uh, audits. Thanks again for joining us and have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. Thank you all so much.